American 587 heavy. 2,300 feet above the ground, disaster strikes. The plane is losing altitude and falling out of the sky. Holy crap! And the plane is heading straight for the houses of Queens, New York. Flight 8509 takes off from Stansted Airport at 6.36 p.m. Positive rate confirmed. Gear up. Gear up. Passing 900 feet. The aircraft had taken off. That uh, climbed to about two and a half thousand feet. Shortly after takeoff, the aircraft was making a, a turn. Left turn at 1.5 DME. Copy that. Left turn at 1.5 DME. The aircraft started its turn to the left. Heading standby, sir. Heading 158. The captain's artificial horizon tells him that the plane isn't turning. Bank's not working. Bank! Bank! Look! Bank! For some reason, the 747 has gone from takeoff to total destruction in less than 60 seconds. AAIB technicians have salvaged the recording from the badly damaged CVR. One of the most important things that was on that recorder was the sound of a warning horn going off in the cockpit as the aircraft departed from Stansted. But even more significant than the sound of the alarm is what is not on the tape. They seem to be ignoring the alarms completely. There was no discussion uh, about the, the fault with the artificial horizon. Crews are trained to trust their instruments and not their senses. Captain Park trusted his ADI in spite of overwhelming evidence that it was wrong. The first officer should have said to the captain, look at the warning buzzers going off. It's very difficult to understand his reactions or lack of reactions. But I think a lot of it is embedded within the culture I was at that time. Fearing dishonor more than death itself, the first officer did not dare criticize his captain or even attempt to correct his actions. This crew were not operating as a crew. They were operating as one man with a couple of assistants. The aircraft just continued to roll to 30 degrees, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 degrees of bank. Investigators now suspect that the seeds of the deadly crash were sown hundreds of years before the 747 ever left the ground. Sir. For centuries, a rigid class structure based on social hierarchy defined Korean culture. Investigators have come to see how the Korean military, an honor-bound institution, has strongly influenced commercial aviation. It's now clear that strict adherence to cultural norms put the crew of Korean Air 8509 in danger from the moment they entered the cockpit. Captain Kevin Stables is preparing to pilot Emory Worldwide Flight 17. His first officer is George Land. They're hauling freight across the country aboard a 30-year-old DC-8 cargo plane. Uh, hi there. Is that the load plan? Just before they're finished up and loading the last uh, couple of containers, they would give us a list of all the freight containers and how much it weighed and what position on the airplane it was. There you go, boss. Then we'd take that information and we would calculate the weight and balance on the airplane and make sure that it was all correct. OK, 
Airspeed's alive. Alive here. 80 knots. 80 knots. Elevator checks. Just another routine takeoff. V1. Rotate. But as the nose wheel leaves the ground, the DC-8 pitches upward much more steeply than it should. Watch the tail. They recognize that they have an issue during the course of the airplane actually starting to rotate as it lifts off the runway. V2, positive rate. The sudden takeoff is quickly followed by an uncommanded left bank. I got it. You got it? Yeah. This is anything but routine. We're going back. What the hell? The center of gravity's way out of limits. They need to return to the airport as quickly as possible. Emery 17, emergency. Emery 17, say again? When a pilot declares an emergency, that really cues an air traffic controller to know that this isn't just an abnormal situation. This is a critical situation. All right, all right. The ground proximity warning begins to sound. We're sinking. We're going down, guys. All right, all right. OK, we're going back up. The DC-8 starts climbing again. Roll out, roll out. But the pilots are still struggling for control. Uh, Emery 17, extreme balance problem. Emery 17, roger. The airplane started to go into these big perturbations, dive and then climb, dive and then climb. They push their control columns all the way forward in a desperate effort to level the plane. Power. More? Yeah. Captain Stables and his crew have managed to get their crippled plane to within sight of the runway. It was working very well. He made it almost all the way around to the backside of the airport. They knew if they could get back to the airport, there was going to be crash fire rescue that would have been able then to help them. They've now got less than a mile to go. They're still trying to look ahead to figure out what needs to be done next. But they know that sooner or later, they got to get on the ground. Sao Paulo, Brazil is the largest city in South America. With 16 million residents, morning rush hour is always a crawl. The traffic overhead is busy too. Residential neighborhoods are packed tight around Congonhas Airport, one of Brazil's busiest hubs. Every day, more than 500 flights come and go from this airport. Today, 89 passengers are getting ready for a short hop from Sao Paulo to Rio de Janeiro. They're flying on TAM Airlines. The Brazilian company has just won an award for best regional carrier and wants everyone to know it. Good morning. How are you doing? Great. One of TAM's most experienced pilots is in command. Jose Antonio Moreno has almost 6,500 flight hours. Before start checklist? Yes, Captain. Already done. Good. Go ahead and call the tower so we can get these engines started. You got it. First Officer Ricardo Luis Gomez is less experienced. The 27-year-old has only been qualified to fly the Fokker 100 for one week. Sao Paulo. TAM-402, we're ready to go and requesting engine start. TAM-402, you're cleared to start. Fire him up. Starting number one. Starting engine two. The short haul jet is powered by twin Rolls-Royce engines. Flight 402 is underway. V1, rotate.
it seems like a routine takeoff. No, 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 no. Then, less than 50 feet in the air, the plane rolls dangerously right. The captain needs to level the plane fast. The captain's efforts start to pay off. The wings move back towards level. What was that? It's a brief reprieve. The airspeed is dropping dangerously low. Worse, the captain can't keep the plane level. It has to be an absolutely sick feeling for that flight crew at that point. After being delayed for more than an hour, Span Air Flight 5022 is finally getting back underway. There are 166 passengers on board, many of them looking to escape the stifling heat of Madrid in August. Everyone was full of anticipation. Everyone wanted to be on their way. Anna Stefanides has come to Spain from Sweden. She is on her way to the Canary Islands to meet some friends. Most of Europe has holidays, different summer holidays in August. I was going to Gran Canaria to meet my girlfriends. We were going to have one week's holidays, four ladies. Spanair 5022, Joe Nexon line on runway 36 left. OK, here we go. At 2.23, the MD-82 aircraft starts speeding down the runway. One hundred. The captain watches their speed. They can't lift off until they reach 157 knots. Takeoff speed. V1. Rotate. An alarm warns the pilots something is going wrong. Engine failure? First officer increases power, but he's losing control of the plane. How the hell do you turn off that warning? The plane is less than 40 feet from the ground. I managed to think, this is my last trip. I've had a good life. I thought, now I die. Fly the plane. Fly it. Oh, God. Just seconds after takeoff, Flight 5022 slams into a riverbank beside the runway. The plane, with 172 people on board, is now shattered wreckage spread over half a mile. Bagram Airfield in northeastern Afghanistan. It's a hive of activity. Bagram, ground, ISAF. 9-5, Alpha Quebec, ready to taxi. The crew of National Airlines Flight 102 is on the last leg of a grueling shift. The flight plan has taken it from Chateau, France, to Camp Bastion, Afghanistan, where the crew loaded up to 207,000 pounds of cargo. They were supposed to take it straight to Dubai, but were rerouted via Bagram. Finally, at 3.25 p.m., they're cleared for takeoff. 9-5 Alpha Quebec, runway 3, 
full length. Runway three is verified. Prepare for departure. The first officer is at the controls for this final leg. They're scheduled to arrive in Dubai in two and a half hours. At that same moment, military journalist Stephen Hartoff is on the base's perimeter road, returning from a day's work taking photographs for a magazine. We decided we were going to go get something to eat, and I saw off to the left of the truck a white and purple 747. And I remember thinking, this is a beautiful airplane, because it looked brand new. V1, rotate. Gear up. Gear up. He pulled away from us and started to rotate. And in this case, there was something immediately not right. The climb is unusually steep. What's going on with that aircraft? It was almost stuttering in the air. K keep on that. Get the nose down! I'm trying! The plane is suddenly uncontrollable. The nose won't drop. My airplane! In a matter of seconds, the crew is in emergency mode. If they can't get the nose down fast, the plane will stall. For a moment, the plane hangs in the air suspended. And then the aircraft seemed to sort of careen in our direction. Now you're looking at a big 747 coming at you. Stop the car. And then it completely foundered and stalled. And uh, I remember thinking, he's lost all his engines. <laughs> Don't sink. <laughs> And in a very slow motion, it just went straight down and pancaked into the ground. The explosion was enormous. 8.19 PM, TWA Flight 800 is airborne. explosion tears the fuselage apart. Debris from TWA Flight 800 litters the water nearly 75 miles east of Manhattan. Investigators begin the painstaking task of piecing together what happened to TWA 800. The NTSB's lead investigator, Al Dickinson, faces an urgent task. It was extremely important for us to find out what happened because there were so many 747s flying at that time. The NTSB will lead the investigation. This is a half mile block here. While the FBI launches a parallel criminal inquiry. You know, that people think this is exclusive uh, jurisdiction of the NTSB. That's not correct. If it's a criminal matter, we have to get out there right away. The FBI believes they may already have an explanation for the disaster over Long Island. Three years earlier, in 1993, terrorists drove a bomb into the World Trade Center. Just over a year before, Timothy McVeigh bombed the federal building in Oklahoma. Now, the mid-air explosion of TWA 800 is also being linked to terrorism. It was all over the news how people thought they saw something going up to hit an aircraft. A lot of them thought they saw missiles. NTSB investigators spend weeks carefully searching for any sign of foul play. They study wreckage from almost every part of the 230-foot-long plane. Pretty much during the whole time we were there, we were looking for something that would support any kind of missile or bomb. 
they find no signs of an explosive device. No pitting, no cratering, nothing. We didn't find the uh, soot patterns in a radiating pattern that might have been from a bomb. We didn't find this micro cratering where a hot piece of metal are, are impacting other pieces of metal. It wasn't a bomb. No piece had any evidence of a bomb at all. November 12, 2001. It's the Veterans Day holiday in the United States, a day off for many. But at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport, it's another busy day. Flight 587 lifts off at 9.14 a.m. American 587, heavy. 2,300 feet above the ground, disaster strikes. The plane is losing altitude and falling out of the sky. Holy crap! And the plane is heading straight for the houses of Queens, New York. The sound at first was just a normal airplane flying above. But I was still in bed, kind of half sleeping, half awake. As it started to get louder, that's when you felt a little vibration. We're stuck in it. Tower, look to the south. There's an aircraft crashing. Airplane going down. Get out of it. <clears throat> Get out of it. Get out of it. The house started vibrating very heavily. You know, this all happened really quick. The fuel ignites a massive fireball, engulfing several homes. My whole um, window was bright orange, really loud, really bright. I just jumped up uh, looking for my glasses and pretty much with my dad ran out to the front of the house. Are you missing any flights? American Airlines Flight 587. We ran out the front door. All I could see, because I didn't have my glasses, I couldn't find my glasses. The whole street was covered in flames. Uh, my whole side of my house was covered in flames, and uh, there was just black smoke billowing up, like, really high. What the hell happened? I remember looking back into my house, and the whole kitchen area was just black. It was all thick black smoke already. Fire rips through the quiet neighborhood, and a city still in shock from the events of 9-11 is plunged back into fear and chaos. Was this terrorism, or was it an accident? <laughs> 